Welcome y bienvenidos to this episode of the Cultural Capacity Podcast. I am one of your hostesses and teachers here on the podcast, Justine Gonzalez, and I am so thrilled for our episode today. Um, it is our featured voices episode that you'll be listening to. So pause right now, stop the press. If you haven't already, please, please, please go hit follow on the podcast platform you're listening on right now, Audible, Apple, Spotify, et cetera. Or if you are streaming this on YouTube, please go hit subscribe. We uh, are very blessed to do what we love to do here at Educator Aid and the Cultural Capacity Podcast. However, you all make it possible for us to continue to learn, grow, and expand together and have more guests, uh, more content, and all the things and continue to up-level our show. Okay, thanks so much for your support. And thank you to each of you who has been longtime listeners, subscribers, and viewers. We are so glad that you are back for another interview. So typically, you know that once a month, we have workplace wellness episode with our in-house wellness expert, Kara Gonzalez-Howard. Uh, then we also have a featured voice, which is an extended interview with an industry thought leader, uh, emerging voice, et cetera, in different subject matter expertise areas all across the industries, giving us a lot of learning and a lot of just story and being able to learn from others here at the podcast then we have a couple episodes each month uh, that we're testing out right now. We've implemented a mix-up episode, a mashup that might feature other podcasts and talk more about popular cultural events and political events happening. And finally, a shorter version episode, which is still reflective of our old formats of asking a question and going deep with it. So we're glad that you're here. And without further ado, in this featured voice episode, you know, it's probably, I'm probably most nervous for this episode, sister. <laughs> I'm not really. However, you are hearing and seeing a more formalized Gonzalez sisters than maybe you're used to if you watch our other content and you do hear from us both regularly here on the podcast. However, I told my sister at one point, you know, you're going to be a featured voice on the podcast and the day has come. So I am going to introduce her no different than my other guests that I get the pleasure of sitting with here. And, oh, sorry, chia seed in my teeth there. Um, <laughs> but she is also going to receive her flowers. And no, she doesn't know what I'm going to introduce about her. My flowers to give my sister, I could give so many. I'm not going to bore you all or make her cry or make me cry or anything like that. But what one of the things that I admire most about my sister is just her unwavering commitment to seeing something through. That is the first thing um, I can tell you from very young age, right? I've known my sister literally since I was born. Uh, my sister is not only resilient and persistent and consistent in life, she shows up as her whole self. And she also unapologetically sets boundaries in masterful and graceful ways. And I learn a lot from her about this. I am not as savvy in those ways. So she's a perfect balance. The other thing um, that I want to say is she's an incredible, I actually texted her and her husband, but both of them, and, and my sister's the one sitting here, but both of them are just incredible parents to my nephews and niece. And I, I haven't, I don't witness that very often. I'm not saying that just because my sis, she's my sister. I don't have to say these things, but I've been in K-12 education a long time and cross paths with a lot of parents. And I would say her and her husband, Anthony, are a rare breed in how they allow their kids liberation and freedom, but also show them unconditional love and teaching that is sound and strong and helps inspire discipline. So I'm going to quit Thank going you. on and on, but those are all the flowers. There's so many more. Um, and my sister is not only my best friend, uh, a confidant. She's also worked to build educator aid for the past two and a half years with all of the ups and downs that comes with, with working with me, <laughs> but, but that has been a blast. And I, I literally, my final flowers, I wouldn't be standing here today without you we wouldn't be sitting here without you. And Educator Aid would not be having the impact that it's having right now 
without you. So thank you to our vice president of innovation <laughs> marketing. That's her official title at Educator Aid. In case y'all wonder, there are many other ventures and she might talk about some of those, but she's also the executive producer of Sketch Therapy Network, a channel and a show on YouTube. She may talk about that later, but I did want to drop that so you all are aware. Um, and she she does a great job of directing me. I just tell people I love to show up and put on wigs and she tells me the rest. Um, so I'm glad to have you here, sister. And I'm glad for the people to hear a different side of you maybe than, than just that goofy side or just the behind the scenes matriarchal role that you often play at Educator Aid. Um, because there's a lot of depth and a lot of experiences, both um, heartwarming and heartbreaking through her career in nursing. And I'm excited for you all to get to know her. The Kara behind the vice president of innovation marketing. So Kara Gonzalez Howard, how will you introduce yourself to our guests? You're, you're on the podcast often as a hostess yourself. So how will you introduce yourself? Wow, that was an amazing <laughs> introduction. I have a little tear in my eyes, both eyes, not just one. Um, that was very sweet and I needed that today. So thank you. Um, yeah, I, it's very uh, difficult. I think sometimes when I, people ask me what I'm doing now to kind of boil it down. So I was in healthcare for almost two decades. Um, I went to a, um, started out at a state school for my education, transitioned to a private um, Christian Mennonite college in Goshen, Indiana. Um, then I got my degree in nursing. I was an ER nurse for um, about seven years. I transitioned to a different hospital because we moved. Uh, I became a bedside OB nurse um, and postpartum nurse at that time for about five years. And then the last five years in my career were as a nurse educator. So I did education with nurses at a large healthcare system in Northeast Indiana. Um, for those last five years, specialized um, in, you know, adult education. And also I did um, a little bit of clinical teaching with my alma mater <laughs> um, for a little bit. And that was really a neat experience as well. So I do have a lot of practical, you know, scientific bedside knowledge of nursing, but I also um, developed a um, knowledge of the education world, not only through my sister who has worked in K-12 education since her inception, but also um, as, as far as teaching other adults. So that actually comes in super handy in this role. Um, right now I am working on, I, I'm kind of the background lady slash executive coach in different ways for my sister. Um, I help keep us organized and focus it on track in a lot of ways. Let's I, okay. Let's be honest. Cause if you all listen or you have listened, or maybe this is your first episode, woohoo, welcome, go back and watch some of the other ones too. But you'll notice over time that I am very, like, we're both very blunt and transparent at times. And we, we get that a lot from our mother. May she rest in power. Um, but you say that so people need to understand I was just going to highlight a funny point I <laughs> am often we both can can process a lot of information very quickly we we have that brain capacity and how we're wired we've realized that more about ourselves as we've gotten older and and what a quote-unquote superpower that can be and by the way I think all of you have superpowers too so I hope you're unlocking them um but I say that because she keeps me on track, not only in the difficult ways, but in the ways of because she knows me well, she knows what will push me. And also in the simplest of ways of like, literally, I will go oh, like a bunny rabbit and she'll <laughs> pull me back in and say, what is really the main thing here? So I wanted to point that out because that is definitely a skill that you have, whether it's dealing with myself or your children or other adults, you're very, very good at um, centering people, grounding people, getting them back to square one. So I just wanted to name that. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I also do a lot of other things at this point in my life. Um, I just kind of Justine mentioned, I'm really good at setting boundaries and I do agree with that sentiment. 
I don't have a lot of guilt around saying no to things that I don't think are for me. Um, other people may think they're for me, but I, I don't always think so. So that has allowed me over the years to kind of hone in on different opportunities that have come along and have time and space for those things. Um, right now, I'm serving on um, two boards. I'm serving on a board for a mental health nonprofit organization in my community. Um, and then I'm also serving on our local school board, um, which has been a huge honor and also pushed me in a lot of ways and, and also um, allowed me kind of space to be part of a team that's making real change in our school system and our community. So I, I really get excited about my board work with the school, especially because it is the place that I can um, advocate. You know, I'm not just out there, you know, posting things online about what I think should happen. I get to actually help with that process. You change forward. Which is a really unique and amazing opportunity. I'm super thankful. So anyways, yeah, that's pretty much well, we're happy to have you here. Um, you did not bring your tiny mic today. I see you didn't bring your tiny mic. I didn't bring any mic because I'm trying to project and, and be, you know. I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, so we're going to tap into some key questions we always do. But first, this oh, is- Oh, I'm using mine too. Yeah. So, so my sister and I have this thing about notebooks. This one is golden girl. And if you can't see at the top, the little tabs are actually the little heads. Yeah. Mine's this, almost full. Yeah. So I actually just started this one this year because I am part of, I'm now part of National Speakers Association. So basically anything I do related to speaking or hosting, I, I'm using it for this as far as brainstorm or questions I want to ask podcast guests. So I do have um, and, and we typically have these segments with any guest, but if you've listened, you know, it always goes back to personal story and what that person feels led to share or chooses to share. So no two interviews are alike. Some of them get very heartfelt. Some of them get tears. Some of them are like lots of laughs. So who knows what direction we'll go here, but we still will maintain our same segments as always. And this first part of the segment uh, or the part of the interview is the first segment. Your story is your power. And I know here, not only Kara and I, but as well as we give a shout out to some of our new team members that are part of Team EA Network as affiliates and independent contractors. One thing that we are big on is people knowing themselves so that they know how to try to go deeper and understand others. We really believe in pushing each other and living out and walking our talk. So it's not just about creating the educational tools for us. It is about giving people that freedom to go as deep as they want to in their own personal and professional development journeys. So the story is your power is really about us exploring together and getting to know you through what's called a cultural origin story. And you know, if you've listened here again, any type of culture, whether it's organizational culture, your personal individual culture, it has these five core components that are reoccurring with our beliefs, our norms and values, also language and symbols that are important to us. Those are all multi-layered things that have lots of elements under each of those umbrellas. But when we think about our own cultural origin stories, it is really the things that led us up to this point of who we are in this very moment. And part of that involves looking at our belief system, looking at big events that have happened in our lives and shaped the way that we operate, our norms, or perhaps the things that are recurring as part of our purpose and the things that we really find value in, our values and how we show up in different settings. So all of that to say, talk to us a little bit about your upbringing. And this again should be a little unique and interesting because your hostess, Justine, who you probably know a little bit about if you've listened, you will find that as much DNA as my sister and I share, as much as people say, oh, you all laugh the same, you smile the same, we also are here to demonstrate you can share a heck of a lot of DNA and also you have very different lenses of the world, very different lived experiences. So I'm excited to hear how my sister shares. And, and talk to us a little bit about little Kara and your childhood and just growing up. 
You know, our dad just told me the other day, and he said this to me several times over the years, and it always surprises me, but he said, you know, I never expected you to go and get married and live out in the middle of nowhere like you do. Yep. He said, I said, well, what do you expect? What did you expect? And he said, I don't know. You were just so like into different, like performing our stuff. And I think in his mind, he thought I was the city girl, which is more Justine. He's and told me the same. You are. Maybe oh. you were going to be the country girl because, you know, of your love of like landscape, your landscaping job and stuff like Mowing. that. So, <laughs> so I just, I always kind of respond like, well, you know, it's just kind of what happened and nothing just happens to us. I didn't realize that, but um, yeah, I've always, I've always from a very young age, just sort of uh, floated in a way where the wind blows me or um, in, in my interpretation of that, I, I listen to the voice of God, not the literal voice of God, but um, God's hand in my life. Yeah. And I don't discount any opportunities that come along, no matter how weird or strange or unfitting as they may seem. Sometimes things pop into my life for different reasons. And I I could never have told you when I was a little girl, I didn't, I had no idea what I wanted to do other than I knew um, I was shy when I was little. Yeah, we both, I was <laughs> very shy. It's hard was to little. believe, but we were both like very, we're to be seen, not heard. And like, yeah. it was hard to even get us to say hello to people. I think that was against my nature. You know, looking back, I was reflecting on that the other day, I had a lot of anxiety. Yeah. I would um, want to vomit every time the first day of school rolled around for about the first six years of elementary school, um, because of how nervous I would literally get physically ill. So I had a lot of anxiety, but once I kind of like found my friend group and like came out of my shell more, I got involved in cheerleading in junior high and high school because I was not a sporty girl. I was not going to be out there pushing people around on the field or on the court in any capacity. I had not a competitive bone in my body, really, um, at that age. She would never play (laughs) one-on-one basketball with me. No, I became competitive later with like dance and cheer and, you know, theater and stuff like that. Like I wanted to be in stuff. And so you had to be competitive to do that. Um, But I just always made sure I was trying to be at the top of my craft. I would work super hard on it um, and it got me places. So I, I still don't know why I chose to, well, no, I do know. I shouldn't say that. I chose nursing as my career, which was completely, it wasn't a mistake. And I don't look at my career as a mistake. I had beautiful experiences. I had really hard experiences, um, but I wasn't really like, my strength was not in science and math and ma- and nursing is very <laughs> science and math heavy. So I really chose that career based on the fact that from a very young age, I always knew I wanted to be a mom. I always knew I wanted to have a family. Um, and that I believed at the time, and it did, it allowed me to yeah. have those things and have a flexible schedule, um, work nights at times to be able to provide for our family and um, still be able to spend a lot of time with my kids. So um, yeah, so I'm just kind of, I don't like putting myself in a box necessarily because that box is always changing. I don't care if people are confused about who I am and <laughs> what I stand for. It really doesn't matter. People that are closest to me know who I am and love me. Um, and I think there are plenty of people who aren't close to me who yeah. who appreciate me as well. But in my experience, it's always just been really important to nurture my close relationships. Um, that's about all I have the bandwidth for a lot of the times. So I have um, a very tight circle and I'm very, very picky about who I allow in so that I can make sure that um, those that I love the most, I'm taking care of. Yeah, that's beautiful. Some, another thing I admire about you, um, and that's okay too, if you find yourself going, oh, well, that's not my personality. Kara's yeah. daughter would say that. There are times that, I, yeah, there are times that I wish <laughs> I'm I not that way. <laughs> and I was going out and, you know, being with people all the time, but that's just, that's not me. I've always had a very close circle that, you know, we support each other and, you know, that, that's that. I like it that way. So, okay. So, so myself and the listeners tell the people they, they, I do want them to hear a little bit about this because 
at this point, I've lived more inner city, majority of my adulthood, recently became a suburban, a suburban dog mom. So now I'm in suburbia of Chicago. And we've also both had a lot of experiences in rural areas, but Kara has now been a resident in a rural area. Um, it's interesting. So even outside of that context in the United States for listeners outside of the U.S., I also talk often about the topic of being a third culture kid, which I think in millennial generation, which we both are and down, is way more common, not just in the U.S., but in many parts of the world at this point. So talk to the listeners a little bit, because again, if you've listened before, I'm sure you've heard me talk about us and our family and the unique attributes of our parents and those bloodlines and that heritage. But for you, Kara... What was it like growing up in the Midwest of the United States as a third culture kid, meaning coming from a bicultural home where we were creating as a family unit, we were creating kind of a new culture because our mother came from a very specific background with cultural norms and our father came from a very specific background with cultural norms. Um, Talk to people from your standpoint, from only you, What was that like growing up as a third culture kid? That's a loaded question. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Um, I didn't really uh, think about it. I didn't think about it too much other than going into spaces. I still have this. I still have a very specific way of going into new spaces and being around new people. Um, I would say just for safety, like emotional safety purposes, When I go into spaces, I don't usually feel like I fit in or that I'm going to fit in or that I'm even welcome there a lot of the time. And that's not to shade anybody that's in those rooms. It's just how I feel. Um, And I have felt that since I was little. So I'm very cautious about how I integrate other new relationships into my life. Um, I... I also feel like it's a huge blessing because I am kind of like a super sleuth in a lot of ways. And I get to, I love being the person at the back of the room or in the corner. And I love people watching. I love observing other people. (laughs) And yeah, I, I don't, I never like really thought too much about some of the things that we face growing up, like, because we are white, you know, but our last name does not match what we, you know, what people in their brain think the box that we should fit into or what we should look like. Um, there was a lot of questioning about um, legitimacy and like, like, what am I and um, different things like that. So I always kind of felt like I went to the beat of my own drum. Um, in a lot of ways, I did what I wanted to do. I went where I was accepted and appreciated. And if there were people that had questions about me because of who they thought I should be, I, I didn't really associate myself with those people. So, um, and then moving into, you know, college, we had a very conservative, like Justine said, a very conservative side of our upbringing. Um, we have a men and I Amish background and we grew up heavily in the Baptist and evangelical world. So there's if that. You're but not, if you're not familiar with those particular sects of Christianity, those are very much more conservative, legalistic. Like when we were young, the church we were part of was Baptist and women were not supposed to wear slacks, pants, trousers. You couldn't drink. You couldn't have alcohol. Yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't even go to the movie theater. Cards. You couldn't go to the yeah. movie theater. So just to paint that picture, and that was in the late 80s, early 90s. So just to give you concept of even what we were used to with going to church three times a week, that that was at least more solid for, we have a younger brother as well, but for me and my sister in particular, because we're the two oldest. Um, I had to, I was thinking about this the other day, actually, because I think our mom was rebellious in her spirit. Okay, so even though she said all these really conservative things to us a lot of times in trying to bring us up that way, we were allowed to go to public school. I was allowed to put on a short skirt for cheerleading in seventh grade and eighth grade and wiggle my booty out there. Mm -hmm. And I was allowed to wear spandex on 
you know, in dance mm -hmm. <laughs> in high school and do all these things that it's like, I was okay, allowed to wear a skin tight dance. unitard and prance around. Yeah, <laughs> I was allowed to be a performer, which was like yeah. in church, just like women are to be silent. You know, you're not supposed to bring attention to yourself. You're supposed to be modest, all this stuff. Well, hang on but though. Hang we on. We were though. allowed to do all these things. And, I, but I want to say this so you don't omit it. And so people know when the star was born. So, Tell the people, what was your first stage appearance as a solo artist singing? You were about oh, five or six. Bette Mid oh, you were about say, five, five or six. Year high school, I think. No, Bette it was the at, it was <laughs> at the Baptist Church, and you all have to understand, oh, massive Lord. sanctuary, like over a thousand people could fit in. I still don't know how or why I I was put in that situation because that I was so. I was so afraid of everything at that age. Young. But you sounded amazing. Like, I remember watching you. I don't know if you know that. I remember watching you. And I remember thinking, oh, my sister's so cool. I think I blacked out. But I don't really remember too it much. It was for Father's Day. It was for yeah. Father's Day. This, you know. And our dad still loves this. Yes. I think it's weird a little bit to go ahead. Tell the people. I'm sure tell the people you're solo. Too. it was called, I want to marry daddy when I grow up. <laughs> and it, the lyrics were, I'll wash my face and comb my hair and show him that I really care. Yeah. I want to marry daddy when I grow up. So we, um, we know why our dad treasures it and that's not weird. Yes. What is weird is yes. in our own deconstruction journey, which so many of us have been on despite the actual religious upbringing, whether you're Muslim, you know, Christian, whatever in the world, this is something that's happening in our generations of going, oh, no, we need to rethink how we think about the, but now we look back and go, oh my goodness, it was brainwashing from the time you were born of the patriarchal structures of what women are supposed to be doing to make their husbands proud. Yeah. And like, love them. Anyway, yeah. sorry. That took a turn, cultural capacity. <laughs> no, but I, I wanted to point it out because that was one of the first times, right, that I remember seeing you on a stage. And you you have been a performer throughout your, your whole life. I think when I was in seventh grade, I was blessed enough to make the cheerleading team. I didn't I had not had a day of gymnastics. I stretched so much between sixth and seventh grade that I learned how to do the splits. So that was cool. I and I used to try to do them too. And that's when I had to first accept my first growth mindset, you all, when I was about <laughs> eight years old and she was able to do those things. And I was able to dribble a ball and, and make a hundred <laughs> free throws in a row, but I had to go, yeah, I'm not shaped like her and I can't do those things. I loved, I just, I found my body at that point. I loved being able to push myself in those ways. I loved learning like dance and being able to bodily express myself. And I felt like um, I could completely be free in those moments. I loved all of it. So I've always had that sort of, um, attraction to that because it's an outlet for me. There aren't a lot of situations that you can go and um, express yourself with your body that's accept like socially acceptable. So um, I love that. And I still love it. And yeah. I do it right now in the privacy of my own home, own home. As soon as the kids are out of the house, I plan on auditioning for some, you know, things for some theater productions. Really? So oh, see, yeah. this, is, this is news to me. I mean, at that point, I'll be like the old lady typecast, but I don't care. <laughs> I'll be the old lady that can dance. Okay. And do the play. I might have to make this episode explicit, but I have to say it this way. You'll become like the stage mom, but also like, oh, yeah, that's that's the old bitch that has one line at the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh no, I will have more than one line. Oh, you will. It I just I it was funny because of the way you said it. And I immediately thought, oh yeah, that's that's what the 20 somethings will say. <laughs> so, so right now my compensation for that that bug or that itch is to do our sketch therapy channel. Our it's at sketchy therapy on YouTube. 
that's pretty much where I post all the time. Um, almost, well, not so much daily recently because we've had a lot going on, but we post at least one like episode every week. We have a bunch of different characters in development. Each of them make their appearances different times, um, wearing wigs, having different, you know, characters. And we talk about the social and political climate that's uh, in our world that's too touchy to talk about, just as Justine and Kara. So we kind of like make fun of the things that drive us nuts about our society. Um, and it's been a huge. Can you also paint a picture? Can you paint a picture so people also understand this? Because I just now in the consulting world, I've started to realize like people low key, like, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, a superintendent that I work with was like out of nowhere was like, oh, by the way, I love your TikTok content. <laughs> So now I'm realizing like, okay, there are, but people may find it fascinating to know most of our family does not watch or even know that we have this whole YouTube channel of like improv sketch comedy. And many of them actually don't even know what we do together at Educator Aid. And I, and that's okay. At first, you and I struggled a lot with that when we're first starting out as full-time entrepreneurs, which now... For me, I'm I'm hitting year seven. For you, you we've also both been very entrepreneurial, even through our teaching nursing careers. One of our first things as adults that we went to together was a Mary Kay conference. <laughs> oh my <Yeah>. gosh. <laughs> so like we've always, I feel we have it in our blood. You know, we, our grandparents had a lot on both sides, had a lot of entrepreneurial spirit and also just like, hey, I'm going to disrupt this because of intercultural marriage because it's, of it's a form age. of rebellion for me yeah, and I do yeah. think it comes from my Puerto Rican side I do give it that because like what we we're talking about earlier with my upbringing our upbringing this whole other dichotomy of we have this very conservative side at home but then also our grandparents my dad's parents our Puerto Rican side owned a restaurant with a bar. And our grandma was we the bartender. All the time. <laughs> music, you know, people drinking, smoking, all this stuff. So oh, it's this whole other like we'd see our teachers getting like like there were teachers from the schools we went to that would come yeah. to the restaurant and get plastered. <laughs> I never knew that was going on, but oh, yeah. I always remember being afraid of smelling beer when somebody walked by. I would hold my breath. If somebody I knew had a beer at their table walk by me, I would hold my breath because I'm like, I, this is like, I'm afraid of this smell. What is this going to smell like? It's bad. So it has to smell bad. Did you, in your kid brain, did you think you're going to get drunk off of the vapor? Of I don't know. I just thought, <laughs> I don't want to smell this. This is so bad. So, um, but anyways, I think that a lot, like that was the window, right? To be able to see, oh, there's a whole other world out here. And yeah. then being at school and seeing like some of my other friends being able to do different things. Um, but I've always, I need, I've needed that outlet to, and I still need it at age 42 to be able to like, I don't know why. I, I think for me, what I have realized, especially over the past year it balances, there's a part of me that craves that type of energy and that type yeah. of creative release because it's so different than the the data and communications work that we do at Educator Aid. And so for me, it's almost this balance of right brain, left brain. I love both. Yeah. I'm great with both in different ways. And I think most people are, but sometimes we don't know how to balance out that brain power. It helps me process my emotions and thoughts a lot. So I can turn a really, like, I know for comedians, like they turn a lot of very negative experiences in their life into something funny that they can laugh about. So that's what it does for me, like on a cultural level when I'm, I, I can get very overwhelmed at like the state of the world and things like that, because I'm raising three kids. I didn't think about it too much before that, but now I have to think about it. Um, and so it helps me release some of that. I also, I, I do agree too. Like it's helped me to become a better uh, communicator, a better speaker, a better everything and think like quickly on my feet. More Whereas confident. before I, I just, I don't think before I started doing our YouTube channel, I was very able to, fully communicate in the way that I 
felt like I should. And to be honest with you, I had to examine, I had a sense of shame about starting the channel in the first place. And I still revisit the sense of shame once in a while because I don't want people to get the impression I'm doing it for attention because I'm definitely not. Um, no, neither. Can, like, Please, if you watch them, we're this, not doing it. We're know. not getting attention for it. Yeah, so. You'll know <laughs> they're not doing this for attention or likes. <laughs> I know there are probably, probably plenty of people that do and it can come off like that. But for me, it genuinely is like a processing thing and it just brings me joy. And like we play off each other. So I don't care if anybody watches it other than like the two of us. If we think that like I always die laughing at we the spend, things. In the scene. Just so you all know, <laughs> like if she does one or I do a character or something, we will literally have the video in there. It's not live. And we'll send it to each other, like just yeah. like we would any content from any other comedian, because to us and for you all to know, we shared. So the the first 14 years of my life, I'm sharing a bedroom with my sister. We lived with our grandparents on our dad's side at one point and shared a room like we have wild stories from that. We love that house. That's when we first started recording ourselves on a big boom box. Like, so, so there's certain things when we go back. And this is a great modeling for people to understand when they hear, because I know some people kind of scoff at, oh yeah, inner child work. Oh yeah, inner healing. No, we literally have taken this journey of revisiting what lit us up. And actually our mom, like she's told us before, it was so entertaining because we would lay in bed. There was one house we lived in on 113 and we had twin beds, peach comforters, twin beds, but we, I mean, our beds, it was small room. So our beds were only like a foot apart. There wasn't a lot of space. We share a closet. Kara would find pit stains and stains from me wearing stuff. I wasn't supposed to, that was hers. <laughs> to the point where this, this woman, she was a girl at the time. She created a notebook and she needed to bap out because she didn't want to repeat outfits. It was my journal. It wasn't a notebook. You were in my journal. Well, no, that was a diary and I just happened to figure out how to get it open. Um, it had a lot. No, but she would start saying, this is what I'm wearing this day. This is what, like, she started scheduling that out. I wanted so, to make sure I wasn't repeating outfits yes. too often. And then if she would choose something and go, why does this smell like B.O.? <laughs> the funny thing is, I think between the two of us, we probably only had two weeks worth of, of clothes. Right, but somehow. right. But then we would make it go further by alternating. <laughs> but, but. All that to say, I, I know our mom would say like, you all were just so entertaining because we would lay in bed at night. It's kind of amazing that we actually were rested well. When I think back, we would just talk about bizarre things. What Justine doesn't know is I was always asleep and she was just laying there Probably. talking. Probably. I'm just kidding. No, it's very typical of today still. So. <laughs> no, it's, um. but so talk, talk to me then. So Kara is entering the nursing world, but during that time when you have the shift of, you were even an RA at a large state school, but yeah. you shift Ball back. Ball State University. Ball State, go Cardinals, chirp, chirp. Um, if you're from Indiana, you know all about it. Um, but then you transfer. What yeah. initiated the transfer to, we got to rep them to good old Goshen College, where mm -hmm. you not only taught now as an adult professional, but you attended there, you graduated from there and you would, you would tap back into a very cultural part of who we are. Yeah. Um, talk to so, us a little bit about that because I'll say this, Kara, my friends who only know of you and they yeah. know about our background, these are usually Chicago based friends and they're being authentic. They have, they always want to know about Amish and Mennonite. And they also are fascinated if they've ever, and I'll, I'll even say, I'm like, yeah, my sister was a practicing Mennonite, like literally as an adult. And yeah. then they want to know everything. So people, truly people want to hear about this experience. And I am not a person who reverted to that. I stayed in that evangelical zone for a while. And Kara, you decided to actually become a practicing Mennonite. Covering. I still, I still do consider myself um, to resonate most with that particular yeah. genre of faith or denomination, that whole Anabaptist um, 
uh, faith, you know, I don't know if it has to do with like just our ancestral roots or what, but. What is uh, Anabaptist? Will you tell the viewers? So Anabaptist was a movement that broke away from like the Protestant branch um, way back. I, I don't even remember dates anymore, but they left um, Europe and they came here for religious freedom. Um, and I actually live, my county right now is over 50% Amish. So I still have that around me, which is comforting in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways, I, I, I view the Amish a lot as like the, um, the conservative, like Mormon church. Yeah. Of more I would agree like, with that. I'd, like more like F FLDS a little bit. Yes. Kind of culty in a lot of ways. It's yeah. also a very just old practice and so when you're keeping traditionally the ways that you've had it you're not probably looking to change too much but anyways um I I had a great first two years at the state school it was an amazing experience um I dated a person there who uh this was like when 9-11 happened was my second year there and he was in the military um and so he was getting called up to go over to the middle east and i was devastated and i don't even really clearly remember like the whole breakup i know i ended it because it was just not something that i could handle um it but was tough. On, that, it was tough on you. I was in a lot of distress, and I think I just needed to come home, and I didn't really know what else to do or where to go. Um, and my mom and dad like heavily encouraged me. They said, "You know, we, you can come live at home. Just go to Goshen College. It'll be great." They said. Oh, I'm sure <laughs> they did. And at no. that point, it's like I was in a very infantile state emotionally, and I just sort of did whatever. I could do to find comfort in a lot of ways. Um, and that ended up like being, I, I was thinking about this yesterday. I don't even remember living at home during the, those couple of years that I did. I don't even remember. I don't have any recollection because I think I was, there, I was working. Like, and you you weren't really there a lot. And my only frame of reference was there were two summers that coincided with it because no way the last thing and I was only there during like two months of summer essentially but even during that time because we that was on Lynn Drive that like we had our own rooms at that time but that you, like you were never there and but I yeah. was also the same like in college working doing multiple things so it was truly a way to save money and thank god you know our parents allowed that yeah so um, during that time, I sort of like was kind of rediscovered. I'd gotten a little wild and crazy and wooly at college. And I was like, okay, I need to rein it in. I need to, I was going to church and stuff. I had even been on a mission trip to Romania during my couple years at Ball State. And that was wonderful. Um, but I just- You went on like, a sister yeah. spring break. Yeah, we did. <laughs> um I was just trying to figure out ways to, I don't know. I just started having these thoughts of, I'm not doing this right. I need to find the right way to express my faith. Um, at the time, I had a group of friends that was conservative Mennonite, but they were like, in the Amish tradition, they call it rumspringa, where they're like in their wild years or wild phase where they basically can do whatever they want. They can um, it's the period of time when you're a teenager where you can go out and you can explore. And that is open to interpretation. The parents don't judge. The community doesn't judge. You do whatever. And I was doing whatever during my years at Ball State. So anyways, I found this group of conservative, conservative Mennonite people that um, I really loved hanging out with, you know, and I was like, well, they're the girls in this group are wearing coverings most places we go like we even I would snowboard with this group <laughs> and like the girls would wear their coverings while they were snowboarding and things and it was I don't know I think it was probably me trying to fit in in a spot because I started going to their church as well and but then I also along with that was studying scripture and felt like oh, actually scripture does say women should cover their head and worship. And since you're supposed to worship God all the time, 
you should always have your head cover. Okay, makes sense. So I started doing this and it was very uncomfortable. It was very uncomfortable. I had friends and family that were like, oh, we didn't actually mean this. This isn't actually like important. This is super, it was really funny like what people chose to fixate on because these were like Christian, very conservative people. But it was almost like it was like, oh, you're joining a cult or something because you're choosing to do this. And I'm like, what is different about, it's this little thing I'm putting on my head and I don't understand how this is any different than you choosing not to do things. Um, I'm doing something to show my faith. They call it the sin sifter. Oh, really? And I've never even heard that. Like, it was like a judgment of like, oh, you're trying to look holier than me type of thing. That's so, wait, so hang on. So, and you all know, I jokingly always say I tell on myself, you all have heard me say this. I've already done a public apology to my sister, I'm not doing that again. But <laughs> no, but I, this is interesting though, because I've never heard you describe it that way. Yeah. Um, I knew there was hurt. But I also knew the role that I played in that. And for me, though, I never perceived it that way. I just I couldn't understand it because like I had visited you at Ball State and I I knew Car- my sister's a free spirit. Why is she doing so for me? My deflection tactic was comedy and it was saying, oh, well, you got to put on your covering. Don't forget your covering like which is not okay. So I think this is actually a really perfect conversation because often, especially in the States, we think that the heated conversations and stuff come from only racial tensions or only sexual identity tensions. And actually most of the discrimination and people being shut out of their own families in the States, at least, I think it goes a lot back to religious beliefs. And it's very petty. It's very petty because we grew up with our great grandma. Like we never knew her to not wear a covering like that. that We were just used to that. And it wasn't strange. It wasn't weird. There was nothing to make fun of for me as your sister. It was just so different than who I knew you to be. And I didn't understand it. And quite frankly, I didn't even know how to like, it didn't bother me. I didn't ever feel embarrassed. I think a lot of our, like some of my friends and um, like, our parents and stuff, I think were embarrassed. Like they didn't want me going out in public with them looking. Like I, I, had, felt, I, was I, I would, I would give you, I would rib you, but I, I never felt that way. But I also had friends at college who were also like one of our cousins, she was yeah. a practicing Mennonite and we were friends at college. So like, yeah. it wasn't that part to me, of me. I was like, Oh, I found this thing that I can like grow closer to God. And like, also I know I want to get married and have a family this specific culture like really is into that and I you know I I think this could be something for me you know I think I'll find a good man to marry in this you know group of people or whatever that wasn't the only reason I was hanging around but it's like I so as I got backlash somewhat from from people and different responses and it wasn't always overt it was like just you can tell when people are like you know it just felt like well okay if I'm doing this I'm making people uncomfortable I don't know if it's worth it at a certain point um so I just sort of I just sort of quit going to church there I went back into the evangelical world which I felt really like when I stepped back in I remember I went to the church uh that our parents attended in Goshen for a long time. I know, uh, I know. What name it. You know what I'm talking about. Um, but it felt like uh, it was a mega church and like not too mega. It, it was, was attempting to be on that fringe of the yeah. early 2000s, mid 2000s rise yeah. of the classic Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, more mega. Yeah, church. it was a concert. Like, yeah. you know, people wearing yeah. jeans, um, like nothing wrong with that. But yeah. I'm like, you're going to church could you like put on a proper you know outfit to worship in or whatever I know God doesn't care but it's like it's going to a wedding in jeans to me it's like personally I would love for us to all go into spaces where we can just show up naked and worship because that's Uh. how God (laughs) sees us and brought us into the world I think it would be distracting but Don't put those and tambourines I there. Be on those chairs, don't, so. don't put those tambourines there. 
um anyways it just I just felt like ugh, this is not for me so I started I just would go to chapel during the week we had to go to chapel a couple times a week as a requirement for um college and they had hymn sings I loved it I felt like it was chill if anybody's familiar with Goshen College or Heston College in Kansas is similar like Mm -hmm. it's a very liberal it's a liberal arts school even though they're Mennonite affiliated it's Mennonite USA which is a very progressive and um, internationally affiliated affirming church yeah they had a lot of international students at our school and so it was a very it felt comfortable for me there and beautiful it didn't feel judgy I had a lot of friends that were in that con- that specific Mennonite conference and I actually lived with that group of girls um, my senior year who were all like Mennonite like progressive Mennonites and I would it talk to cool. them about things I like, loved oh. I loved visiting you most at that at that house you I you seemed I loved I loved happy it. and at home yeah. like during the college years when we would get together and stuff yeah. I, I felt the most like, okay, my sister is cool. And like, she's okay. Like not, not because you asked me to do that. You just know that is my tendency is to worry or take on people's things, even if they don't ask me to, and I'm getting better about it. But I, that made me feel better. Cause I knew, I knew how hard your breakup was. And I knew you were, you were trying to fit in the same way I was feeling yeah. because I was also I don't even know if I was like, trying to fit in. It was like I found cool people to hang out with and find, yeah, find kids. find a crew. Find yeah. a crew that you could actually yeah. trust and have fun with. And I could have done that, I'm sure, without going the full way of doing it. But then I was also studying scripture at the same time, thinking, Oh, I should be doing this. Like I was convicted. I was like, I really right. need to do yeah, this. This is the right way for me to be as a woman. Um, and so but then also that left me feeling like, oh, I can't wear makeup like I did. And you and love makeup. I love, you know. <laughs> you worked at a makeup, makeup counter for years. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wear the clothes I want to wear. Like all you these things. You hear a common I... theme of the clashing and yin and yang of our worlds once yeah. again. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyways, I just felt very comfortable in the, you know, kind of progressive Mennonite space. The girls were wonderful. I started, and we talked about our faith and it was, it was like, uh, for a while, Justine, I was convinced they weren't even Christians because they didn't speak the same language of evangelicalism, which is that we saved been, by grace, accepting Jesus into your heart, salvation, all this yeah. stuff. It wasn't the same. There was something like we're reading the same scripture. We're both Christians, but like I have this thing where I have to say this specific sinner's prayer in order to be saved. And they didn't have that in their, their liturgy. Like it's, it was just like, they, it God was loves me. Imagine God, God loves, loves me, me and just as to, I am. Because of that love, I'm supposed to outpour that to others around me and care for others around me. And that is the bulk of my Christianity. So it was a whole different thing. I wasn't judgmental towards it after, you know, here, like knowing them and knowing who they were and realizing like, oh, these are actually amazing, amazing people. They're not hypocrites. Like a lot of the people I knew in the evangelical circles that I was running in, they're not like pretending to be one thing and struggling with this, this thing in secret. They're just like living their lives honestly and authentically. And I loved it. And trying um, to be in community along the way. So yeah. I have there a, is such a community there too. I have a compassionately curious question. And and viewers, you all know, we love to get compassionately curious here because it does help us better understand people, their story and, and who they are right now in this moment. What advice would you offer to those, not just in the United States, but the, the thought process you're describing, you might hear people call it programming, conditioning, sometimes colonization, depending on the model of religion that you're part of. But even if I've grown up in a conservative Muslim home, a conservative Jewish home, a conservative Christian home, conservatism has the same elements, even if it's wrapped around different scripture or different core beliefs. And a lot of it all goes back to the same tactics of 
wanting to control people through legalism and or make sure that they have a certain way of viewing the world or seeing the world. Both you and I have gone through this process and are still in it and will be our lives because I believe in the evolving of faith. I believe in a living faith and connection with God and our creator. So that being said, though, when you're starting to have those realizations as a early 20 something and going, wait, 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 I know this feels like love and this feels like the unconditional love of God that it should be. And I'm seeing how this plays out in people's lives. How did you get away from that and realize, because you you just shared something that is really key. So if you missed it, listen to what I'm saying, or go back and listen to what she said, which was, I realized, oh, I'm nervous about, wait, 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 do, do they really belong to God in the same way? And what sometimes our belief system we're brought up in has us believing and secretly, even if it's subconscious bias, we're already judging someone like, oh, well, they're this though. Like, for example, a common one in our upbringing was friends that were Catholic and, and right. Like you were, even though it wasn't explicitly taught, but you heard it in adult conversations and it would literally be this, oh, well, no, they're not Christian. They're Catholic. So, so there's a, that happens in Protestant world. It happens in different sects of Judaism, Islam, that's actually universal. So how does one start to become more aware? Because there's some people on their journey. It's not a judgment, but it's simply a fact. There are people on their journey. They have no interest in understanding and they truly believe their way of believing is the only way quote unquote to heaven. But for those who are starting to go, you know, I know that person believes differently specifically about the LGBT community, or I know that person believes differently about marriage and what it means and how it happens. How did you rectify those things when you know, and you're being shown, but they're actually the love of Christ and they're the love of God. And these are my friends. And I don't think they, I didn't, I didn't rectify them. I just, I went to my default mode, which was it's not my business. Mm. It's not my business. As I got into my nursing career and I worked in ER and I was seeing, you know, several patients a day, different people, wild, wild. The door, their deepest, darkest moments. Yeah. You realize as you're sitting and praying with people or being with family or whatever, it doesn't matter. Yeah. This is a human standing in front of me. So that started the process. Like my nursing career honestly started the process of like, uh, it's not my business. I'm here to love you. And that's it. Um, and then, you know, when I, we, you know, as we had, as I got married and had kids and stuff, that, that whole process, my kids asking me yeah. questions around Christmas time about, you know, we were reading these stories. It was the advent jesse tradition like you you read through the prophecy from isaiah up until the birth of jesus through christmas the very first couple lessons my kids are asking well mom there's there's only two people at the beginning that had kids how did they how did there get to be more people were they at this age they're they're knowing a little bit about sex and like how babies are made right how did these two people what what's what's up with that you know things that I just honestly as an oversight I guess never really considered it's like (laughs) oh well these very basic questions that these really little kids are asking me and I don't have an answer for I'm also not going to just be like because it is the way it is and you have to believe this like we were not going to do that with our kids Um, well that's an important uh, part of your process to point out and name for people in that you realize, so, so realize this, if you find yourself resistant to certain elements or she, like you realized, oh, I never thought about that before. And it doesn't really make sense. Well, that is exactly, somebody was like, yeah, this this is is what happens when you go back and evaluate. Of course, we didn't think about those things. Why? Because our form of the pastoring and stuff and how the word was taught was literally to a point of you're just concerned about not being damned to hell like like that so then when you're controlled by fear you're not thinking then about asking questions and going oh wait in the christmas story 
what did blah, blah, blah. No, you're just, you're just so freaking scared about covering your own ass. So you don't go to hell. I wasn't, I didn't have that experience. I wasn't scared. Tell, I'm saying that purposely. So tell people your experience. Cause that was my experience. Of I don't, honestly, I don't even think I ever really believed in hell. And I only say that because in theory, yeah, sure. I said that, but I've never had this concept. Like I've never looked at another human and been like, Oh, they're probably going to hell. Like I've never thought that because I don't believe that a loving God, a compassionate, all knowing, powerful God needs us to be perfect to be in his presence Mm -hmm. or her presence or their presence or whatever you want to say. (laughs) I don't believe that. And I never fundamentally let alone do we need to be out here trying to be God's little assistant. So I was, I, I never have had that intrinsic fear. And I am grateful for that because I know a lot of people that is one thing that keeps them from even starting to ask the question because they're afraid of this thing called hell that they have been shown explicitly images of terrifying images of from the time they were popped out the womb. Okay. And told about all these, I don't know if I just blocked it out or I was just like, oh, okay, let me just go over here. And no, uh, I said that at the beginning about boundaries, because I've watched you my whole life and we are wired differently. And Kara knows this. We've talked about this extensively. Clearly you also have to as well, because we grow and evolve even in working in business together. There's ebbs and flows to everything you do and you're going to have growing pains, but that comes out in everything we do. She's always, you've always had much more of a self-advocacy. And even if you're not telling people what you're doing or you weren't telling our parents, you are going to decide your own life and create your own life. For me, I, I latched on to more of that. And part of it could be birth order as well, but I latched on more to that people pleasing tendency and then having that reinforcement in how we were disciplined at home by our mother specifically I think for me, that absolutely what you named, and I'm pointing this out so people see the differences because they might attach more to your story or mine. But I know, especially even in Catholic tradition, a lot of people talk about Catholic guilt. The reason why is because you were introduced to God as a condemning God. And for me, that fear was what latched me on to the point where there were times, Karen knows about this, it's comical now. But because of how your brain is wired to and what you latch on to, there was a time period when I heard something talked about at our Baptist church and mom got so frustrated at me because I would literally, I had heard the part of it that said, you should confess any thought you have. So it doesn't like deteriorate you or something like that. I would literally go tell her, oh, I, I thought about this bad word. I would tell her everything. She's like, oh, shit. And she shit. eventually, what yeah, she, correct. <laughs> eventually, she's like, who cares? Just go play. But for me, who is a deep thinker and I wanted to do right by God, it morphed into people pleasing and self worth issues. So I, we have to be clear about it because there was a different agency and advocacy. And even though we were experiencing a lot of the same things, Every kid is different with what and how something is, is indoctrinated. I think, yeah. As a form of self-protection, I probably leaned more towards doing my own thing. And that meant at times keeping things from my parents yeah. that meant um, twisting the truth quite a bit because it's like, I know I will not be accepted here if they know this. And I need to protect myself right now. And I don't, I still don't know. I don't feel, I don't have guilt about that because I was living my life. And also in my mind at the time, I was making them comfortable as well because perception, perception is everything. Now, do I go about my life like that now? Absolutely not. I don't care. I surround myself with the people that love me and support me. And that includes my family. You know, like they're not, it's interesting because you went the route of protecting yourself. I went the route of abandoning myself to try to please. 
And yeah. so that's also an important difference. Well, which is what you're technically you were doing the right thing according to what we were taught. Well, but... Right. According to it. However, it doesn't mean that I <clears throat> actually even took the time to think, oh, this is right or wrong. No, I'm terrified. I'm terrified of being disciplined physically at home. And I'm terrified of then this supernatural God striking me down with lightning because I thought a bad thought according to what, according to what a Sunday school teacher who has no knowledge of theology told me, I don't know. Right. So you look back at that and I'm saying this because so much of our audience is parents. Just remember this with however you are teaching your children and allowing them to choose a path because it's just not, it's, it's just not always going to be processed the same with all of your kids and your kids are different and that's okay. And and that, that was something though, that I always, I think admired about you, but I also was very unaware of how much that influenced a lot of my anxiety and just a lot of things and, and why I, I had, people I will there. say I latched on to the fact that I learned that I was loved by God, even though all these things were saying contrary, right. I knew what scripture said. I knew that my relationship with God, I felt loved and I felt guided. And so nobody was going to tell me differently. If you're telling me this all knowing being is, you know, who I need to be in relationship with and I am, and I am experiencing love. I'm not going to believe you when I say, when you say X, Y, Z about my life choices or the fact that this person over here isn't like, like, I don't believe that. And I never have. Um, you think it yeah. came from a young age, we, uh, and we won't go in detail with stories or anything like that, but do you think it came from a young age, some of the encounters we had because of some mental health struggles with our mom, but from a very young age, I mean, you were the first to experience those things from yeah. a very young age. Do you think that somehow that, that already determined self-preservation? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, excuse me. For sure. Sorry, coughing. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you for entertaining those questions. Final question I did have, just curious, because I don't think I've ever asked you this directly. When you were more deeply like practicing certain things of the Mennonite faith, did you get questions then about your heritage and your last name? No. Interesting. No. Just a cure, again, that I've never even thought to ask you that. No, and I will tell you right now, my belief is that is because not, it's kind of an, it's can be an isolated culture, but also it's a very accepting culture. Yeah. No matter how conservative, yeah. no matter how conservative, they lean on their love hard. And there's and actually a huge population in Puerto Rico. So, And I will say too, that that particular Anabaptist sector of Christianity was not involved in um, the white supremacy movement in the United States in the way that the Protestant and evangelical faith were. They tend to yeah, drop so, that there. Yeah. So that particular sect too, that you were a part of for people to also understand, they are not in the business of projecting and forcing belief. They're no, very much, absolutely not. which means that they do not believe like our grandfather on that side was a conscientious objector to Vietnam. Like there was, yeah. or maybe was it Vietnam or was it World War II? Yeah. No, it was World War II because his brother went, no, it wasn't but, World but War also II. Vietnam. It was probably Korean War and then um, Vietnam as well. But that that's also important to understand. Like we were very much brought up with it was not about pledging allegiance to a flag or country, which was also adverse to the evangelical tradition. And that was only having present. flags everywhere. <laughs> yeah. That was only present when there would be like, oh, a fourth of July day at a church that we went to. Like, but yeah. the thing was, that was actually antithesis of what our, either of our parents actually do or believed. Like, that, that was one of those things, though, like the same reason I chose to associate myself with a conservative Mennonite church for a while. They were in a lot of ways, I think, trying to they found the people that they like to be around and they were trying to fit into that mold. And this they did what they like, because there's so many things about mom and dad that I'm like, when I look at it, 
they don't really like I don't think they actually mom and her like I think she had so many things that she didn't cling on to in her head she loved to learn about different things and expand her mind but then she was always like kind of put back into her place in a lot of ways by herself because and and by the people around her who you know told her like oh this is the way you have There's to believe fear. in order to be accepted. Our, our mom was similarly wired and I know this to me she was I think she was fearful herself of different things and well I can't really do or say this me, and I might go to, but hell. I actually do believe, yeah, but I actually yeah. believe this is okay. So I think that was a consistent battle, you know, for her, uh, when, when she was on earth here. So let's move into on the day that she passed away. She had called our grandma that morning for no reason. This is completely unlike my mom to say, um, and I don't know, my grandma's at the grocery store and for some reason, I don't know if they're talking about somebody that had been at the grocery store that my grandma had encountered. Grandma says she doesn't remember the conversation like leading up to it. But mom, she told me mom's response to whatever they were talking about was, well, mother, God loves everybody. Jesus loves them too, or something to that effect. And I just thought that was a really interesting like it's just I something just thought that our mother weird. would not uh, our mother no. would not have always said that let alone to her so mother. I think on her final day yeah. I think somehow she, she found her voice she came to that peace yeah. and knowing yeah well and she was also she would talk with me a lot so again when you grow up in that conservative or if you're relating to this because you're like oh yeah my mom actually is very against this or you know if you have parents who are over the age of 60 and especially if they were raised in the Midwest in more conservative traditions, it is harder for them to understand. It doesn't make it right, but it is harder for them to adapt to then somebody who says I'm non-binary, right? Like that's a different language to them culturally. So they're trying to understand. So I know like with our mom, one of those instances, she had a neighbor where she had moved into and they would talk and sit for hours. I secretly think that he, that she would bum cigarettes off of him, but, <laughs> but it, uh, because our, our mom had this wild side that she just did not show. And she, she had repressed a lot of that because of religious teaching and her thinking, well, what's right, what's wrong. What, wh what does it mean if I do this, am I going to go to hell? And that is how she, you know, that is how I was introduced to God by her. And that wasn't because that's a condemnation. I wouldn't change anything about our childhood because it's made us who we are. Um, we can all look back and regardless of where you are in your journey, regardless of abuse, um, mental, emotional, physical, sexual, we all have different tragic events that are going to happen and do happen in our lives. So we either choose to get through it and we accept it in all of its ugliness and all of its beauty and we alchemize it into something better for ourselves or not, but we can't go back and change it. So at a certain point, I've said, how can I fixate on the best parts of my mom? But I say that because it, it was a gay man that she, I mean, that was kind of her bestie, honestly. And we know she had a lot of struggles, but he was nothing more. He, when we went to her apartment, we saw him yeah. in the park and he cried. Um, yeah. But and so I know that, then simultaneously when we would talk like we would talk and catch up for hours we would have these streaks of like I knew what my mom liked to debate about and talk about <laughs> and I knew that would fill her cup that that would be enough for she her. was really worried about my salvation yeah. we were putting out all yeah. these videos at the time about our deconstruction yep. from faith everything yep. like that that we weren't like still identifying as Christians we were just weren't in the same boat anymore right yeah. um and I remember having this conversation she was at my house and she goes this is probably six months before she passed away I said something about not believing in hell or something like that and she's like oh like whoa uh, where where do you think like all these people go that don't accept Jesus and yes. I go mom she was also very literal and had savant tendencies yeah. as well just so you know and, and <laughs> We got into this whole debate about it. And I finally just looked at her. I go, mom, I don't believe in hell. Do you think I'm going there? And she goes, I said, you know me. 
I said, you know me better than it, like most people. Yeah. Do you think? And then she just stopped and she was like, her face like softened and she's like, well, no. And she, then that was yeah, the end of the realized, conversation. She realized what you started realizing with your friends in college. Yeah. But yep. that also, you know, that is what happens, especially when people are older, they've worked a lot. They, her and our dad worked really hard on trying to stay together in their marriage. They both did. I mean, they did everything they could. And it, there was a lot against them. Like when you get married at 19 and you come from the two different worlds they came from, my God, like what, what a beautiful thing that you really wanted to make it work so much. You made it over 40 years. That's that's wild. And you go through so much change. They had three of us. Like, so yeah. when you really stand and look at that, try to understand, especially if you're having struggles with parents or grandparents or understanding their beliefs or why maybe they don't like your, your same sex marriage or you're not married in a church partnership or, or, or like whatever the thing try the only way we are going to move forward is to empathize. And I absolutely know the opposite end where you're crusading and you're standing up for yourself and saying, no, this wasn't right that you taught me this. And this wasn't right that you did this with me. That's okay. Cause you're realizing it, but don't yeah, stay yeah. there forever because you somehow have to come back to trying to understand that empathy of meeting someone where they are and they're worth it. If they're your loved one. Now, if they've caused you so much harm, like there was also a lot of years where we had to set a lot of tough boundaries with our mom. So that, that also influences whether it's religious or mental health or anything, addictions, all of those things, regardless of your situation, these are cultural matters. That's why we're talking about them because I think sometimes when people think culture, they think race wars, they think politics. And that's all they think about with culture or they think for the culture, popular culture, hip hop music, that could be true. When we talk about culture, we're talking about these stories that with our guests, with ourselves, this is actually what drives everyday decision-making and ultimately your destiny in life. It is the core beliefs you hold. It's the values and norms by which you show up. And I believe it was Socrates said, an unexamined life is not a life worth living. And therefore, if you're not living, then you're fixated on your in imminent, for all of us, your death. So you choose what you do with this chapter in this time you have in this body you have on earth. And I think that that's valuable. And if you're not spending time reflecting on who you were as a kid, why you think the way that you do about the world, then that you're you're actually depriving yourself of living a more liberated and full life of understanding who you are and the love that the creator has for you period i really think that my whole faith deconstruction process and i would say i'm in reconstruction right now um yeah. but i think that that heavily influenced my ability to depart from nursing and like sort of see that part of my life as a death in different ways yeah like because it did not that nursing like healthcare and um faith have too much to do with each other but for me it was the same deconstruction that happened when I left my nursing job yeah. like it was a period of years of seeing bullshit happen um and it was a similar process of like letting go of the attachments I had and the Worth I found it's a in that process. grieving in that, and then seeing at the end how little and insignificant my actual impact was to mm -hmm. like the people around me. Not that it wasn't great to my patients, but right. like deconstructing from that system. Like we talk in. Um, one of our courses about religious systems, right? Mm -hmm. I I think that any system that you're a part of yeah. has these elements of you're in or you're out, right? You're gonna yeah. Yeah. drive to this certain philosophy or you're not. Um, and that also deconstructing from faith and being able to leave church and not look back and think, okay, this is actually harmful was a similar thing that happened when I left healthcare as well. Yeah, And it was pretty, pretty quick. 
Yeah. So on that same vein, and because I know that we, um, well, you know, sometimes we go for a while here, but this is, this is a, a little longer one too. We're proving that in 2024, there really is more with our featured voices, because <laughs> if you haven't our first one to kick off the year, I have to give a shout out to Courtney Hartman. And actually, so you all know, that is one of my sister's colleagues from her time in nursing. And that is how I met Courtney was through my sister, who you had already had an established personal and professional relationship with. So I love that this year we're kicking off more heavily with healthcare. <laughs> um, and I and need to do a whole episode on my, I've never told the story of why and how I left. And I think that I didn't sign any kind of waiver or release when I did resign, but Will you tell that briefly right I, now. Will you tell that briefly right now? Or you're, you want to do a different episode on that? Um, I, we might just need to do another okay. like part two Deep interview on that. Into yeah. healthcare, the healthcare, yeah. the institute. I would like healthcare. to do an because episode together on I, that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you, well, we'll do that. So if you follow this or you're in healthcare, or this piece, your interest, we'll do a separate one because you all see me do specific stuff about K-12 because that's been my career too. Um, so I I'd think like that could spill, be, I'd like to spill the tea I'd love and I won't name out. names, but I would I'd love, love to. Uh, I know a lot about the story you all, and I think it would be powerful because one of the things that we both shared in leaving those systems and institutions was how similar they were. And yeah, wouldn't and you know, just, the mm -hmm. same similarities are exactly what we've named regardless of the religion in today's episode, as far as institutionalizing whatever the beliefs are, whatever the organizational practices are. I also, those. yeah, I also want to talk to people about how to find good healthcare. Um, sure. Because it's, it's difficult, even as a former nurse, like, and it's we need, very difficult we need right to hear now. that exactly. because Kara knows that that has been a huge struggle for me and my partner as entrepreneurs and it's been hell. I, I got scammed by a company so much so that ABC Houston reached out to me because I reported them um, and they were in numerous lawsuits. Like it's wild, wild west. And I think that could be fascinating even for our international listeners to know because yes. there is... A lot of Americans, I'm going to say something that might be very unpopular, um, and it's it's through the lens of my own truth, and also talking to many friends, just spent two and a half hours catching up with a colleague in Costa Rica yesterday who's an expat from the U.S., and she made a comment at one point like, well, you know, a lot of the world can't stand Americans anyways. So That's true. It's true, and I'm saying this not only because around 50% of our listenership is in North America. But then we also have global audience and some consistent listeners from around, you know, multiple countries, over 35 at this point. So when you think of that, and I would encourage anybody who's listening, and maybe we can find a resource to link it. If not, please Google, because you'll find what, what you need to find. There are lists that exist, and it's not just by WHO, the World Health Organization. There's all types of different research ranking things like quality and access of healthcare, reliability of internet, Wi-Fi, um, equity in schools and performance in reading and mathematics, like all of the countries of the world pretty much. And I, I'm going to say this again, it might be unpopular or you might say, I don't even believe you. The U.S., even with access to natural food, resources, et cetera, we are bottom of the list for many of these things. So I am not saying that there aren't cultural greatness things that the world looks to about the states, but I am encouraging specifically our American population who is listening to this. I need you to understand, especially if you're going to travel internationally, you need to understand that often, similar to what we talked about with our church experiences, a lot of the blueprints in the United States go back to self-serving bigger entities and corporations solely for power and money. And because of that, they will lie through media and they have for centuries of we're the best. We're the best at this. 
this is the best. Now, is there a lot of privilege to not having to import things or vice versa? Like, of course, there's also privileges that Americans we do have, import, but we import I mean, a lot of things. That's fun. Yeah. So, like, I would just challenge you all, especially entering into a big election year and with much animosity happening all over the world, please understand context and culture. And if anything, start to ask questions because things are not always as they seem. And it's not about just watching a news channel here. News is just entertainment anyways. And guess what? If it were really news, there wouldn't be commercials. There's an agenda behind everything because it's actually entertainment. Um, So like I put that out there, not as a heavy conspiracy theorist, but as a person who wants to encourage you to get compassionately curious, especially with the times that we are living in and approaching the things you see happening with the economy, please do that homework. It doesn't mean that we don't support those who serve in the military or things like that. No, it means, hey, wake up. There's a big, big world out there. The American population is but a very small portion. And then beyond that, there's a big, big universe out there with many beings. Uh, and, and remember, you are just ultimately, women. we're each accountable for um, the beliefs we who, we who we support in this world, right? So if I don't feel, if I would not feel safe leaving my daughter alone in a room with a certain politician or a group of politicians, I'm not going to vote for them. I don't care who they're affiliated with. Um, if hmm. I don't feel like somebody's moral and ethical compass is uh, anything but narcissistic um, and that they're in a role, not not for public service and to be of service, but because of okay. a bigger agenda, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Um, and I'm, I'm going to speak openly and honestly, and I'm not going to have these black and white ideologies. And I'm going to look at things fresh every time they come up. And I'm going to examine um, my ethics because I feel in every situation, whoever we prop up, um, though that is a reflection upon us as the culture, right? So we can look at our Congress, for instance, at the moment, is a is a circus. It's a clown show. Yep. It's undignified and um, not fitting for a person that serves the office of the United States. And but we are responsible for that, yeah. right? We have nobody to turn to and look at but ourselves. Um, and I think that speaking truth always, no matter what you think you should say, going back to this whole conversation. Just because you're told you should say it so you can be part of this group doesn't mean it's true. Um, yeah. So r- rapid fire, this next segment we call FAQs, Frequently Asked Questions. And it is, what are your most frequently asked questions as a, I've just got two rapid fire from you. As a mom in your house, what are what's one of the most frequently asked questions? What's for dinner? Yes. (laughs) Okay. No, next one. This is a juicier one. And I know a lot of the stories, y'all. So I don't know what she'll share. And it's not a question. What? No, I need to shift it. No, ask me. It's not frequency. It's what was one of the wildest questions you got asked as an ER nurse? That even when you got home, because my sister's very good at, keeping it together. We both do well in like high, um, despite when you see us crack up or have tears. No, we can usually pull off improv because we've literally had to like manage lockdowns and people. Our emotions. And yeah. You, you have to keep yourself together. But then when you go home and process those things, what was something you found yourself going home and going, Oh my goodness. I can't believe this person asked this or did this. Like what's I'm going to say something. Um, so there was a binder. What? I don't think I know this. Ooh. Of pictures of objects, found objects. And I'll leave it up to interpretation where you think they were found. 
Um, but the surgeons had, you know, x-ray pictures of x-rays, you know, no patient names associated with them, obviously. No. But you have, um, but, well, you also have to keep record anyways, right? It wasn't just yes. like, oh, we're keeping a phone. No, 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 no. So I'm no, going to clarify it was like case, that. It was like kind of like a case log. I assume there was some sort of like, oh, a candle's really hard to retrieve out of here. Or um, don't, don't stick glass bottles in this area. Or, you know, things oh. like that. Like, oh. Okay, we'll leave it at that to keep it clean. Um, I know some of these stories though, and you like just never feel embarrassed, especially when it comes to your health, because Kara also knows firsthand what happens when people get embarrassed and they wait or they try to remove things themselves or heal things themselves. Just yeah. if you feel- Sometimes oils aren't enough. Ladies. Yeah, if you feel like this is bad- then go to the ER <laughs> and just let the professionals help you. Um, okay. If your toes are turning black. It's probably time to go see a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> um, this next segment is typically, we, we talk about the inner child journey. We've talked a little bit about your childhood. And I know that always comes out when we look at the cultural origin story with our guests. So Kara, for you, what is one principle that little you, so seven or eight year old Kara, that you lived by and you can still trace to this day and go, yep, that's still true. That's still who I am. So really exercising your inner child, what's a principle that you felt this was really a part of who I was as a kid and it's still part of who I am today that you can offer to people I'm and, going, and it served I, you well. It served you well, whatever the thing so is. So I think I addressed it a little bit earlier, but I always move towards the things that my instinct um, leads me to in different ways. So you listen and to that inner voice, that intuition, and you trust. I it. approach that with like, you know, a slow pace and curiosity. Obviously, I'm not a big person to like dive headfirst into things because, and not that I've been burned so many times, but I just don't. I don't have the energy to dive headfirst, honestly, into a lot of things. Watches like, me. She watches me do it and crash and burn. No, <laughs> it's just the energy, <laughs> the energetics required to jump headfirst into something is not something that I've, I'm, that's it, not my, it's a different, my demeanor human, and personality. Yeah, human design and personality is the difference. Yeah. Um. So always that. And always like, I look at my life as like, like kind of like a river with a bunch of little winding streams off of it and I might uh meander down this stream and then be like oh there's just mud here I'm gonna turn back around and go back to the river or I'll come over here and oh there's a beautiful apple orchard or a strawberry patch I'm gonna hang out here for a little bit that's kind of like like I feel like my philosophy is shift like I can always shift and that is a saving grace because there's no shame in it I don't quit things easily, but I also don't stay in things that don't serve me um, out of obligation. So we have a guest who's come up. She might have heard her. Uh, she might have my favorite her furry me. voice. She might have heard her auntie's voice. OK, co-host. There you go. OK, so OK, so thank you for that. It's really following that inner voice that intuition and trusting it, trusting that and for me gut. also like my inner voice. And when I say inner voice, it's like that connection to spirit creator, yeah. um, Holy spirit, whatever you want to call it in yeah. your particular, you know, walk quiet whisper. of life, the inner knowing the quiet whisper. It's sometimes yeah. also that bubbling almost how I feel it of like, it's your alert system too, of yeah, if you feel that way around someone, you need to listen to it. And of course, reflect on it, make sure you're not operating in bias. But more times than not, and this is not just care, I, I think with most human beings, if you're really connecting with God, and you're trusting that intuition and that inner voice, it's not going to steer you wrong. And when I've gone against it, I should have listened to it. <laughs> so I, I appreciate that. And I, I love that about you too. Final, final thing, unapologetically living out my purpose. This is always our final segment where we ask 
our guest. What are you working on now? Where can we find you? What are you excited about? And what should we look out for with Kara Gonzalez Howard in 2024 and beyond? <laughs> well, where to find me? You can find me here on the Educator Aid YouTube channel. Um, I do a workplace wellness episode usually about once a month. Yep. Um, I also, I have an Instagram. It's at Glam Gourmet Home, but honestly, I don't post that much there. That is something that um, I'm burnt out on social media. So I usually get on like once once a day to look if there's any notifications I'll like maybe scroll once a week maybe post once a week something I'm just burnt out right now but in 2024 I would like to you know I have a lot of passion for cooking and gardening um, and I find those kind of content videos like very benign and relaxing um, so I'd like to start creating some of those types of things myself um, maybe some more makeup tutorials. And I used to do that quite a bit. Not, not so much for like trying to sell something, but just cause I enjoy it. Um, and I want to, I, I want to find creative ways of, I want to work on my videography skills and my editing skills and things like that. So, um, if you want to follow me, you can, if you're like, oh, you're, you're lame and you don't post, that's okay too. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, I do want everybody to follow at Sketchy Therapy on YouTube. Um, that we'll is link, our. We'll link that in the show yeah. notes too. Yeah. That's just giggles upon giggles. We have so much content. It's ridiculous, but it is such a good outlet. And I am really passionate about that. Um, I also have a children's book that is going to be coming out hopefully in 2024. Um, I know my publisher is um backed up a little bit right now with some other projects they're um, working on and so that book hopefully will be getting into illustration in the next couple months um and yeah that's just a book that i wrote specifically about like the characters are me as a little girl and my husband who i think he was as a little boy and we go on adventures together and um yeah, it's got so I'm a magical that character, by the way. If you all wanted to know, yeah, I'm and a magical it. character. I call my sister Teeny, all the nieces my and nephews family. call her Aunt Teeny. That's my family <laughs> nickname. So now y'all know. And the only one who called me just Teeny was mom, was my mom. Um, so we, uh, that that is a special work for me and um, patiently, but also impatiently um, awaiting it. Really it's a beautiful, beautiful text. Um, yeah, I'm honored that I got to it's about it. using your imagination, acceptance, storytelling, all of those things. So, okay, I have a really serious question to close us uh -huh. out. And I don't usually ask a question like this. I know with Courtney, she wanted to talk a little bit about her experience working with you and I in our Eva program. And that was kind of how we ended her interview because that was part of her unapologetically living out of purpose, starting her company and stuff. Um, and doing really well with all of that. This is a serious question. So me and my sister, we have had a tradition. We've, we've always done sisters trips over the years. They were girls trips when my, our mom and sister-in-law were included. Our nieces were coming up, Kara's daughter. And to this day, Kara and I now do multiple like corporate retreats, so to speak for educator aid. We're looking at how to expand those opportunities slowly and in a small way in the coming years. But we will be traveling to Puerto Rico uh, in a few weeks, actually, together. Ooh, I got to get on solidifying all the details. <laughs> um, but our hope is to, you know, offer some different experiences in the future for different people. So absolutely comment if you hear that and you go, hey, I would love to go here or whatever. But the final question is this, because we both have really, we grew up loving comedy. Both of our parents were a riot in their own ways. They both like to be goofy. Um, we really do, when we look back, we had a lot of funny characters in our family, funny people, funny stories. And also we grew up watching a lot of comedy and loving it. Um, so we have an appreciation for that. And more recently in the past five, six years, we actually try to go, we've gone to different comedy shows or different, like looked into different ones, all of that. 
we followed a lot more um, podcast industry five past five years, I would say. Kara's turned me on to a lot of comics I didn't know about, vice versa. So currently right now, and if you haven't, go back. We did open this year with an episode analyzing Cat Williams' interview on Club Shay Shay. So if you haven't, you can watch that one. But here's the question. Sorry, that was very long. Um, you get to sit down and spend an evening having drinks with a comic. Mm. Which of these You already know. No, no, no. Yeah. Which of these three? I'm only giving you three oh. options. Which oh, of okay. these three, which one are you choosing that you're having drinks with and you get to just hang out with? Okay. Conan O'Brien. Okay. Cat Williams. Okay. Theo Vaughn. Uh, you already know. <laughs> really? Really? Yes. Okay. I Well, I'm predicting you're going to say Theo Vaughn. Yes. <laughs> Okay, tell the audience why though. Who who is Theo Vaughn? Because Kara is the one who introduced me to him. He definitely, I mean, especially if you want to be pushed and you aren't from a more conservative lens, he definitely has some more conservative guests. Um, he definitely has a specific lens, but it's also why he has a very large following in the United States and also Australia. I believe he does pretty well in Pacific Asia region as well and does some stuff over there, but um why because you know for me i look at conan and cat like oh man they're just they're they're kings of comedy in a way uh, because both conan and cat as much wonderful work as they've both done oh have God. an ego <laughs> that i can't get past okay. To, okay like it's not like i wouldn't sit down and have dinner but it's like Wait, you heard the- it here first. Kara's rejecting dinner with Conan and Cat. No, <laughs> hey, I have boundary setting. Like I'm good at boundary setting. Unapologetic about it. <laughs> so, um, I think Theo Vaughn is one of the very few storytellers we have right now that is like speaking from the heart and speaking authentically and honestly. Even though some, I mean, sometimes he comes across a certain way to certain people. I read comments a lot on his work, and yeah, you know, people think what they think. Um, I don't know. Well, he shares, so people know he share. he's always shared very vulnerably about his own struggles and his own journey. And there's something very attractive about that. He would like his storytelling is what sets him apart from, I think anybody right now. Um, like his, and I know some of them are probably majorly embellished or even like completely fabricated but I think that is so admirable when somebody can just like off like I just have an admiration for that skill really of like off the cuff just being able to make up like say the most outlandish version of a story and say it out loud and say it in a way that's entertaining funny like touches people like all of those things and he I don't get the sense that he has an ego about anything that he's doing so I don't like I, I don't like being around people who are creating for their ego. Like I can sniff it out right away. It bothers me. I don't care what kind of work you're putting out in the world. Like it just it really leaves a bad taste because it's like, are you here in service or are you here for you? Like it's okay to be here for you, but like also that's a private thing. That's a private matter. Right. And it's important. That's a good differentiator for people to hear because. I don't think that I hear you labeling ego as inherently bad because ego actually serves to protect us sometimes. Yeah. But when it comes through in the work you're doing, but it's supposed to be in service to the world, that is where I also find that like easier to sniff out because you're doing it to get validation or recognition or likes or cloud or whatever the thing. And that tells me you're still actually operating from a fear base instead of just saying, I, like Kara said, we're going to embody ourselves and it is healing for us. And it is, in, it, it's entertaining for us. We are going to keep creating no matter. We're not going to be for everybody. That's nobody. Okay. Yeah. If nobody ever sees it, likes it or anything, because it's fulfilling for us, it's meeting a need for us and it's enhancing both of our careers. And it has, um, to yeah. be honest with you and how we approach how, facilitation speaking, like all the things we do in our consulting lives. So he I, also I, just says yeah. some things in ways that I'm like, like, I love it when people actually say what they think. 
Like yeah. he says some crazy stuff sometimes. And it's yeah. like, oh, I'm not afraid of you because you're actually who you say. Like, I don't no, know the him. Man, the man most recently, <laughs> one of the most recent interviews, Tucker Carlson, and gets into a whole conversation about politicians who do cocaine. Like, yeah. like again, he is just unfiltered. But what I will say, if you're not been introduced to him or you're like, you know, see some of his crap or whatever, I would say, if anything, go back. And this is how I was introduced to him through Kara. And at first I also was like, okay, all right. He's got a mullet. Okay. But then immediately from storytelling, I'm like, oh, he's a third culture kid like us. Oh, he likes X, Y, Z. Like he, because of that storytelling, there is going to be something that you're able to connect with. But I would say start with his material that was part of the dark arts tour. And yeah. that is what actually tuned me into him was, and you see it just like you see with anyone when he's partnered or had segments at times, you and I haven't watched him as much and he's influenced by those things. And now I think he's also in this era where he's established his voice enough We've seen him in person in Chicago. Like he's established that where he, you've almost, we've almost witnessed him dying some of an ego death in a sense. But those to me were some of the first you saw in like 2018, 19. He was the first, especially male comic to just be open and honest and be like, ooh, it's tough out here. And he would take calls of, and, and these are men who are saying, hey, I'm a trucker in such and such place. Hey, I'm a plumber. And such, and they're burying their soul saying, man, I struggle with this. And he's affirming and saying, brother, I I did this. With blah, 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 blah. Like, so I think that is honestly what really warmed me to going, I like him, even though I don't. Uh, his inner, he inner says. I like He'll it. interview a garbage man in New York City the same way that he interviews, um, I don't know, who's Tony one of Tony Robbins. Big- Tony Robbins was one of Yeah, his- Tony Robbins was yeah. just on. And I think not much, Tony Robbins was funny, but it was very entertaining. It was. And if you watch it, I've watched part of it at this point. What I also loved was you see, I noticed, and I was watching for it you see Tony Robbins actually have discomfort with some of the questions because he's almost like, what do you, what do you mean? Cause he's so regimented in a very keynote motivational speaker way. And Theo's like people open. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's like, he almost didn't know what to do because, and he even said, I think at one point, like Theo, I've never met someone just so boldly on like, so I relate because I receive that feedback a lot too. I really, yes. It same brings, same. People, brings people out, but there's a delicate dance of how to do that yeah. and how to make sure that your guests and your colleagues are comfortable with that. And he, I do, I'm biased, but I do think third culture kids, especially, and if you know anything about his story, you know, his father was in his seventies when he was born, like- yeah. He, he learned how to navigate a lot of worlds all at once and, and still be himself. And I think that is something that definitely when you shared him with me, I'm like, okay, I get it. And I, I understand. (laughs) Um, But that, that is what turned me on to him initially. So if you search like Theo Vaughn, dark arts tour, there's probably going to be some initial things that hit you really well. Then you see the time periods he struggled with addiction at different points. So you do see some episodes where, He's got on the glasses and you're like, Uh-oh. <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> and that's not a judgment. It's a, he's very open and talks about yeah. all those things. So, um, yeah. okay. You know, I just had to ask, I had to ask in 2024, where are you at with that question? But <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who I'd choose. I think I'd go with Conan. Conan just has so much depth and. I feel you like and him would get into I some could, trouble. Yeah, some I could take him toe to toe with pranks and like, like I could be Jordan Schlansky, but even hotter. <laughs> um, if you if you guys watch him, you know that's his annoying producer who's like, "Why are we doing this? What's your goal here? <laughs> Is this all about you again?" <laughs> okay, well, sister, it's been a pleasure as always. Um, we've gotten the opportunity to not only record ourselves since we were kids, but also have multiple podcasts and 
and different ventures in the past few years together. So I'm honored that you're officially well, not multiple guest. podcasts, one other podcast. Well, yeah, but then we did like a series on deconstruction of faith and like yeah. we've done some different creative. We things. dabble. We go down the yeah, river. We, we dabble. We try things because it it sharpens our muscles and. Let's us know. Yeah, no, we don't want to do that again. Usually or, I'm oh, attracted yeah, creatively to things that are going to enhance other things is where I'm lacking really. So, well, thank you for being here. <laughs> Viewers, listeners, again, make sure you hit subscribe or follow. Um, it's been a pleasure to be with you on this episode of the cultural capacity podcast. And let's remember as we go about our lives in this busy planet earth at times, Let's continue to get compassionately curious together. Until next time, take care. And this is the Gonzalez sisters signing off.